On this episode of Women Behind Bars, one woman allegedly took part in a vicious hate crime that resulted in murder. My feeling is that he was still alive when they placed him in the trunk. I'm not gonna lie, I want the truth known. Then Chanel Boyd tells her story. She was convicted of inflicting fatal injuries on her eight-month-old baby. There was bruising to the baby's head and hemorrhaging uh, to the eyes of the child. They kept asking me what happened, and I just kept saying she failed. Two women, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of Rita Nitz and Chanel Boyd. On April 9, 1988, campers in the remote wilderness of southern Illinois stumbled on an abandoned car. Inside the trunk, they discovered a grisly scene, the headless corpse of a young man. The car was burned to try and destroy any potential evidence that was inside the vehicle. You expect something like this to happen in the big cities. You don't expect it to happen here. Detectives identified the murder victim as 23-year-old Michael Miley, a gay man who they suspected had been killed because of his sexual orientation. The investigation soon led to a married couple, Richard and Rita Nitz, who were found with the dead man's credit cards. In my mind, we're talking about very evil people. Was Rita a participant in a vicious hate crime? Or was she simply guilty by association? I've got four brothers, so, you know, um, being the only girl in the family, there was always, yeah, there was always competition. Rita Jo Brookmeyer was born in 1959 and grew up in a Midwestern working class family. Her father made a living as a truck driver and only saw his children two days a week. On the weekends when he was home, it was Disney World. When their father was on the road, Rita says her mother was difficult to live with. Mom would just, you know, she would just lose her temper. And unfortunately, I'd be the victim of that a lot. I know in her own way, she did love me. She just didn't know how. If I were to sum up our mother in one word, unpredictable. There was absolutely no way to predict what mood she was going to be in, and that was subject to change at a moment's notice. Despite Rita's memories of a difficult childhood, she did well in school and even dreamed of becoming a lawyer. But her ambitions were derailed when at 16 years old, she got pregnant. She says under pressure from her mom, Rita married her 21-year-old boyfriend, Michael Hayward, in 1975 and gave birth to her son, Charles. The marriage ended five years later when Rita claimed she caught Hayward with another woman. At age 23, Rita married her second husband, who she says was physically abusive. They divorced after three years. She was somehow attracted to, to bad boys. She had a past history of some involvement with men who walked on the wild side. After two failed marriages, 27-year-old Rita met 33-year-old Richard Nitz in 1986. He was a car mechanic who had spent a few years in prison for burglary. On the day they met, he rescued her when she fell ill and fainted in a parking lot. Richard was working at the garage right next door and saw me. And he picked me up and took me to the hospital. The two were married in October of that year. It was just one of those whirlwind type of romances. I met him and within three months, we ended up getting married. But even on her wedding day, Rita already wondered if she had made a mistake. We got married out at the lake at sunset. It was so gorgeous. And when the minister said, you know, you may now kiss the bride, he picked me up and threw me in the lake, wedding dress and all. There's no question that Richard Nitz was a bad guy. He had a long criminal history, and he had a very violent history. However, Rita's brother claimed that she, too, had a darker side. Rita was very good at exploiting any situation to her advantage. It was not beneath her to cheat or deceive or lie to anyone, including myself, to uh, get whatever it was she wanted. 
Rita and Richard moved into a trailer on Pear Lane, a rural neighborhood on the outskirts of Carbondale, Illinois. Richard continued to work as a mechanic, and Rita attended a nearby community college. Within a mile of their home was Crab Orchard Lake, a popular playground for families, boaters, and campers. At night, however, it was a notorious gathering spot for gay men who would get together and party. It's well known in the Carbondale area that there's spots that, that gay people hang out in. Michael Miley was a 23-year-old college student and gay man who frequently met with friends out at Crab Orchard Lake. Mike was a very tender-hearted and compassionate person. He, uh, he didn't like to see anybody hurting. Michael lived just a few miles from the lake. He and his mother went to church every week. My mother was a choir director for small children in the church, and Mike would help her with, you know, the choir. And Mike would come and help me in my Sunday school class. Michael had a fraternal twin named Mark, who was also gay. Michael was known to be a sensitive young man, but he got angry about the harassment he and his friends sometimes encountered when they hung out at the lake. But there were a group of rednecks, for want of a better term, who made sport out of going out to that area and harassing, intimidating, and, and even extorting uh, members of the gay community. Prosecutors believed that Richard Nitz was one of the worst of these troublemakers. He had been arrested before for chasing people around uh, Crab Orchard Lake with baseball bats and threatening to kill them because of their, their sexual orientation. According to police reports, in May of 1987, Michael Miley's twin brother Mark was parked at the lake when Richard Nitz went on a rampage. Richard and two men, they showed up with baseball bats, and as the people tried to get away from them in their cars, Richard and his two male friends attacked the cars with baseball bats, breaking headlights, windows, that type of thing. Rita claims that Richard was also volatile and abusive with her. After only a year of marriage, she wanted out. In January of 1988, which would have been four months before the crime occurred, that uh, they separated. Richard moved out, and Rita and her 12-year-old son Charles kept the trailer on Pear Lane. Rita invited a friend, Betty Boyer, to move in with her. Betty Boyer had two children, and so there became a close connection between Betty and Rita. She also was filing for divorce from her husband who happened to be one of Richard's buddies. So we kind of just supported each other and, and helped each other out. But Rita felt threatened by Richard, so on March 24, 1988, she bought a gun for protection. However, authorities believed that the couple had reconciled by this time and that Richard was actually with Rita during the gun purchase. Richard and Rita had had a uh, stormy relationship during, during the uh, period of their marriage, and, and uh, they were on again, off again. But it, you know, at the time of these, uh, these occurrences, uh, they, were, they were pretty much on. In early April, police responded to another attack at Crab Orchard Lake. Gunshots had been fired into the car of a gay man who drove away unharmed. Police did not know the identity of the three male assailants at the time, but they would later learn that the shooter was Richard Nitz. When Women Behind Bars continues. They were raising a little hell and turned his vehicle over, and, uh, and when they did, the trunk lid popped open and, and out tumbled the remains of Mr. Miley or without the head. In the spring of 1988, just outside the city limits of Carbondale, Illinois, the gay community was terrorized by a series of hate-fueled and increasingly violent assaults that took place at night at nearby Crab Orchard Lake. Police suspected the attacks were the work of several local bullies. At the top of their list was Richard Nitz, who'd been caught out of the lake smashing cars with his baseball bat. On April 6, 1988, the violence escalated out of control. The victim this time was a gay college student, 23-year-old Michael Miley. My mother remembers that Mike was picking up sticks in the yard on Wednesday, April the 6th, because he was going to be mowing the yard the next day. They had dinner together, and then they went to choir practice. They drove separately to choir practice. I guess Mike had plans to go out. A friend stated to authorities that he saw 23-year-old Michael Miley in his car at the lake around 9.30 p.m. Police believed that Miley crossed paths with Richard and Rita Nitz soon after. 
Betty Boyer was a friend of Rita's who, along with her children, was temporarily rooming with her. According to Rita, that night Betty and her children were out at a local cookout with some friends. But Betty's testimony tells another story. Betty Boyer's testimony was that uh, she was babysitting at the trailer for Rita's child. According to Betty, Rita and Richard left the house together twice that evening and took Rita's gun with them. When they returned, a stranger also drove up. Around uh, 10 o'clock, 10, 15 or so, she remembers uh, Rita and Richard returning and Michael Miley uh, showing up at the trailer, the young man getting out of his car. Betty stated that the young man began arguing with Richard. Richard told him that he needed to get off his property or he was going to kill him. And when the man turned around to leave, Richard supposedly reached into his car, got a baseball bat, and ran up to the guy and hit him in the back of the head with a downward motion like this. Richard kept hitting him with the baseball bat several times. Then, according to Betty, Rita just watched and didn't say anything. And then when it was finished, Richard went over to the Miley's car, took out the keys, and he said, help me get the body into the trunk of the car. She remembers Rita helping Richard carry the body and stuff his body in the trunk of his vehicle. Betty told police she witnessed Richard drive off in his car while Rita followed, driving Michael Miley's car. When Richard and Rita returned, Rita went straight to bed, and she claims that Richard got some soap and water and was washing the blood off of the concrete uh, uh, patio. And that was the story that Betty Boyer told. According to Rita, Betty Boyer's version of April 6th was complete fiction. Rita insists she was home taking care of her son Charles, known as Chucky, who was sick, and that Betty was never at the trailer that night. Me and Chucky were home that evening. Um, Richard did come up, you know, park the car out in the road and asked me to come out. You know, I came out. We ended up arguing because he wanted, you know, some money for gas. Rita says Richard left around 10 or 11 p.m. She didn't see him again until sometime after midnight. Richard came back later on foot, knocked on the doors. I didn't even know who it was because um, I hadn't aired his car or anything. Um, knocked on the door, said that he had his car stuck in a ditch, and, you know, would I help him pull it out? Rita claims she reluctantly left her 12-year-old sleeping while they drove down the road to pull Richard's car from a ditch. Then she went back home alone. The next morning, Michael Miley's family knew something was wrong when he hadn't returned home. My dad and my uncles and brothers, they searched the streets of Carbondale, driving up and down, looking for Mike's car. On Saturday night, three days after the disappearance of Michael Miley, a burned and abandoned car was found by some campers near a remote graveyard. A group of young men, I would say in the 18 to 21 year old age. Raised a little hell and turned his vehicle over and, uh, and when they did, the trunk lid popped open and, and out tumbled the remains of Mr. Miley but without the head. The body had been decapitated, so they were looking at fingerprints to identify the deceased. Authorities scoured the area to find the missing head, but to no avail. It was apparent to investigators that whoever committed the murder tried to cover their tracks. The car was burned to try and destroy any potential evidence that was inside the vehicle. Any um, hairs, fibers, fingerprints that could have been in the vehicle uh, were mainly destroyed from the fire. I remember seeing my dad drive up in the driveway with the pastor in the car. And so we knew that they had found Mike's body. Police suspected the murder was a hate crime because Michael was gay and began questioning residents in the area. Within days, Richard Nitz was a person of interest. About a year ago, Richard Nitz had assaulted uh, three uh, gay men. But police had no solid proof that Richard was involved in the Miley case until they got a break. Michael Miley's credit cards had been used after his death at a mall in Kentucky, one hour's drive from Carbondale. Sales clerks at the mall positively identified Richard Nitz as one of the shoppers. Obviously, he went from a uh, suspect to the number one guy on our hit list at that point. 
Police questioned Rita at the trailer and she admitted to having been with Richard at the mall, but she maintained she didn't know the credit cards belonged to a murder victim. Well, when he started walking around the stores and he held out these credit cards, I'm like, since when have you got credit cards, you know? And he's like, oh, well, Glenn and Danny had gave them to him for some work that he had done on, on their cars. Police searched the trailer, cars, and surrounding grounds and discovered numerous items on the Nitz property that had been purchased with Michael Miley's credit cards. In addition, they found several of Michael Miley's personal items. His car radio was found in the Nitz garage, and Miley's gold Timex watch was found in Rita's car. What was not found at the trailer, according to detectives, was the gun Rita purchased just a few weeks before the murder. The prosecution believed the missing gun was key to Michael Miley's death. My feeling is that he was still alive when they placed him in the trunk. They drove out to some secluded spot, and Richard wanted to finish him off, so he did that by shooting him in the head. The head was cut off so that there could not be any ballistics that we could find. Richard and Rita were arrested in May 1988 and held in the local jail pending separate trials. Rita's son, Chucky, was sent to live with his father. We offered Rita a 10-year sentence if she would testify truthfully uh, about what Richard Nitz had done. Rita did not take the plea deal. I cannot imagine that if she had the opportunity, which obviously she did have, to turn state's evidence and, you know, make things go a lot smoother on her. From everything I know about Rita, she would have dumped on him like a ton of bricks. I'm not going to lie. You know, the state's attorney wanted me to lie then. If you tell us that you saw him do this, we'll let you go. I didn't see him do anything. When Women Behind Bars continues. She said she knew where the head was. I want it found. I want the truth known. And later in this episode of Women Behind Bars, Chanel Boyd is accused of fatally injuring her eight-month-old daughter. Her brain was bleeding, her skull was cracked. In 1988, 23-year-old Michael Miley had been killed and decapitated as part of a suspected gay hate crime. Two suspects had been identified, Rita Nitz and her husband, Richard. Rita would be prosecuted separately as an accomplice, although she denied having any role in the murder at all. In August of 1989, just before her trial, Rita gave authorities information about where she thought they could find the victim's head, which had never been recovered. Rita sent them to a remote area where she claimed to have helped her husband pull his car out of a ditch on the night of the murder. That would be the place to look. That would be my best guess as to where it would be. She got out there and it was obvious she was playing games with us. Um, it might have been over in this field or, you know, it was dark and maybe it was over here. Uh, you know, if you guys start digging over here, you'll eventually find it. We felt she was not sincere at all in, in trying to cooperate uh, with us. Rita believed that the missing head would provide evidence to contradict the account of her former friend and roommate, Betty Boyer, who claimed that she had seen Richard attack Michael Miley with a baseball bat while Rita stood by. If the head were discovered and showed no signs of blunt force trauma, it would destroy Betty Boyer's credibility. I want it found. I want the truth known. If and when it's ever found, and God, I pray every day that it is, they'll see. Betty Boyer is lying through her teeth We were trying uh, Rita on uh, the theory of uh, accountability uh, in that she had not done the actual killing of Michael Miley. She had just um, helped, aided, and abetted. The state's star witness was Betty Boyer, but the defense argued that Betty had compelling reasons to fabricate her testimony. Betty Boyer had some limitations, uh, uh, some intellectual limitations, and she had some problems with the Department of Children and Family Services in relation to her children. They told her if she didn't say what they wanted her to say, that they were gonna take her kids from her and lock her up in prison forever. She gave in to the pressure. But the prosecution denies these allegations and points to Betty's consistency on key elements as proof she was speaking the truth. 
She was attacked by the defense attorneys. She never wavered on the fact that I looked out that window and I saw that young man getting beat with a baseball bat and I saw Rita Nitz help him stuff him in the trunk of his car. The defense hammered away at other aspects of Betty's testimony. It didn't work in terms of where Betty said she was, where her sworn testimony, where she was, what she saw, and how she could have seen it. It just didn't work. Investigators for the defense measured distances at the trailer and viewing angles at the window from which Betty was looking out. According to their testimony, it was absolutely impossible for someone to look at that angle and to be able to see Miley's car that was parked down the end of the driveway. And nobody knew exactly where his vehicle was parked. Betty Boyer, she was making an estimate. The prosecution then presented evidence of a single head hair found on the victim's body. Forensic scientist Glenn Schubert's evaluation backed up the prosecution's theory that Miley had suffered severe damage to his head. The hair contained crush type of damage, which could be indicative of some type of uh, head trauma that occurred at some point. Being hit over the head with a baseball bat would cause this type of damage. But the lack of other forensic evidence would help Rita's defense, since it created doubt that Rita had ever been in the victim's car. This went against Betty Boyer's story about the night of the murder. Betty Boyer's testimony, as I recall, had Rita driving away in the Miley vehicle with Richard behind her in his vehicle. And there was never a scintilla, an iota, or nary a peppercorn of evidence which put her in that vehicle. And, and these people were not sophisticated. There were no gloves. They wouldn't have worried about fingerprints. In the real world, um, uh, it's not like CSI. Um, uh, it's uh, quite frankly very rare that we actually find a fingerprint that uh, helps us solve a case. Rita's defense attorney took a gamble by putting Rita on the stand to face the jury. She tried to convince the jury that she was an abused woman. And she came off as uh, being a big liar. My trial wasn't even my trial. The state's attorney went through my entire trial saying, Richard did, Richard did, Richard did, Richard did. Well, Richard is not me. I am not Richard. Betty Boyer's testimony, along with evidence of Rita's use of the victim's credit card, helped to persuade the jury. We were all very grateful and thankful that Rita had been found guilty. Well, Mike was murdered because he was gay, and it was out of just pure hatred. They didn't know anything about Mike. They didn't know what a good person he was. And I think that once she has served out her natural life in prison, that justice will have been served. In my opinion, the conviction of Rita Nitz for first-degree murder was a gross miscarriage of justice and per perhaps even a grotesque miscarriage of justice. And I'm bothered by it to this day. Rita was incarcerated at a maximum security prison in northern Illinois. Her husband, Richard Nitz, was convicted of first-degree murder and is currently serving a life sentence. They have since divorced, and Rita changed her name back to Brookmeyer. The hardest thing about being here and coming to prison at all is knowing every day of your life is spent not knowing. You don't know what happened. You don't know for real why you're here. 20 years later, I'm just as convinced that they are guilty as I was back in 1988. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. Rita is estranged from most of her family except for her mother and her son Chucky, who is now 32 years old. She focuses her efforts on helping others in prison, since she gets little or no contact with family. I do my best to do everything I can to help others here. It's a good feeling to know that you can take and talk to these girls that come in and they're like, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. Like, yes, you can, baby. I've made it. If you dwell on all the wrongs in the world, it'll kill you. It'll just kill you. 
Next up on Women Behind Bars, a 16-year-old girl is convicted of murdering her baby. They kept asking me what happened, and I just kept saying she failed. For more information about Women Behind Bars, go to www.wetv.com. On the morning of February 17, 1998, paramedics responded to a 911 call from a multifamily home in Chicago. 16-year-old Chanel Boyd held her limp and unconscious baby in her arms. The eight-month-old was rushed to the emergency room, where doctors suspected the injuries were intentional. There was bruising to the baby's head and hemorrhaging uh, to the eyes of the child. The young mom claimed her baby fell off the couch, but police suspected child abuse. The injuries in this case were similar to falling out of a second story window, according to the medical examiner. Chanel eventually confessed to police and was charged with murder. But shortly thereafter, she changed her story and accused the baby's father instead. Was Chanel Boyd a teenage mom who lost control and killed her baby? Or was her boyfriend the true murderer? I was rambunctious as a kid. I was hard-headed. I did what I wanted to do. Chanel Boyd was born in 1981 to a mother who struggled with drug addiction. Chanel and her siblings lived with their grandparents in inner city Chicago. My grandma adopted us when we was young because my mom was on drugs. It was six of us, three girls and three boys. My daddy didn't stay too far away, so he was in my life too. The kids grew up in the stable, working-class environment provided by their grandparents, but Chanel remembers how her mother would randomly come in and out of their lives. My mom was so addicted that she'd stay gone for days or maybe even weeks, not sleep, eat, or do nothing but smoke crack every day. If I see her on the street, she'd be looking so bad, and I would walk right past her. Chanel's mom was not a reliable part of her life, but extended family embraced her and her siblings and took part in their upbringing. I was spoiled by everybody, my aunties, uncles, grandparents. Anything I wanted, I got. But as Chanel became a teenager, she admits she had a rebellious streak that caused tension with her grandmother. I was not close with my grandmother. Me and her really didn't get along ever. So most of the time, we argue back and forth. I like to go to parties, hang out with my friends. I started smoking weed every day, drinking every day. Even at school, I was drinking and smoking. I was very wary for Chanel because I didn't want her to go out there and get into any kind of trouble. Chanel also admits that she would get into fights at school that would cause her to be expelled. I got kicked out of school in eighth grade because my little brother told me that these other little kids had jumped on him. So I ended up going to school the next day and fought the little kids. At age 14, Chanel met 17-year-old Jermaine Mullen on a neighborhood street. He was selling drugs. He was a drug dealer. He was a bad boy, and that was attractive. He had money, nice cars. In her sophomore year, Chanel quit high school. I dropped out because I was smoking and drinking so much and not coming home at night, or maybe not coming home for a couple days, and I had started selling drugs. The neighborhood I lived in, it was a lot of bad influences, drugs, crime, you name it, but if you didn't want to do it, you didn't have to. It was all up to you. While continuing to sell drugs to make extra spending money, she moved in with Jermaine at his grandparents' home. In 1996, just weeks after her 15th birthday, Chanel became pregnant. I felt something in my stomach move, and that's when I realized I was pregnant. I was scared then. I didn't want to get an abortion because that was killing a baby, and I wasn't going to do it. Chanel kept her pregnancy a secret for nearly six months, but in January 1997, Jermaine was picked up by police and sent to prison on a drug charge. Chanel moved back into her grandmother's home and revealed she was pregnant. 
She was real happy. She was happy about being a mom. It was scary trying to figure out how I was going to be an adult and grow up and take care of a growing baby. While Jermaine was incarcerated, Chanel says she tried to get her life back on track. I was getting ready to enroll back in school, but that didn't happen because I ended up selling more drugs. Chantella was born May 29th, 1997. I cried all day <laughs> the first time I held her. I was happy. I was happy. Chanel bonded with her baby daughter, Chantella, real good. She really loved her. She really wanted to be a good mom. She was a quiet, happy baby. She never really cried. The only time she cried is when she thought I was leaving. Chanel's grandmother testified that Chanel was a decent mother. And, you know, the baby was uh, healthy, uh, just a little bit underweight, but that wasn't uncommon. Chanel adjusted to life as a new mom, but she admits missing the freedom to go out with friends. At nighttime, I want to run the streets then. Smoke, drink, go to parties, do what teenagers do. In late 1997, Jermaine was released from prison. Chanel decided to move in with him again against the wishes of her grandmother. It was like she didn't want me to grow up. She wanted to just still have control of my life. My mother was trying to prevent anything that you know, bad what happened to the baby. Chanel took her baby and went to live with Jermaine at his grandparents' home. I was thinking we was gonna be a happy little family, but I knew that was not gonna happen with him still selling drugs and yang banging. Chanel says Jermaine rarely took care of their baby, and to make matters worse, she felt he'd been cheating on her. We would fight a lot. We physically fought, like, every week. After she moved with him and she would come here, and I would notice that she would have bandages on her arms. So I would say, uh, what happened to your arm? And she said, oh, the iron fell on my arm. I found out later that Jermaine had burnt her with the iron, hit her in the eye twice, made it bloodshot, and gave her a black eye. I would fight him back. He just wasn't going to beat me up. Initially, when Jermaine was questioned, he had said he had never touched an L. When we informed him that uh, other family members said he did, he admitted that on one occasion he did hit her. While Chanel and her aunt claimed that Jermaine was a violent boyfriend, Jermaine had his own stories of how Chanel could be abusive too. He told police that Chanel got upset at him and sometimes directed her frustrations at their child. Jermaine then went on to tell us she was shaking the baby and then threw her on the couch. And Jermaine kept telling her, don't take it out on the baby. According to Chanel, the couple's fighting got out of control in the early morning hours of February 17th, when an argument broke out over the baby. She started crying, so I got up to change her pamper, fix her bottle but she kept on crying. Jermaine was irritated. He went over there and picked her up. So now he's holding her like this and pushing me with the other arm while I'm trying to get her. So she hollering and screaming still. So he takes the pillow and put it over her face. I tried to get to her, but I couldn't. So he took the pillow off her face and she was hollering and screaming even more, trying to catch her breath. She was so red. So he picked up again and took it and slammed up against the wall. She was just hollering. So I was like, stop, please stop. But he wouldn't. He slammed her head up against the wall again, and she just wasn't crying no more. When Women Behind Bars continues. There was bruising to the baby's head and hemorrhaging uh, to the eyes of the child. In 1998, 16-year-old Chanel Boyd and her 19-year-old boyfriend, Jermaine Mullen, lived together in a tumultuous relationship while raising their baby daughter, Chantella. On a cold February morning, Chanel called 911, claiming that her baby wasn't breathing. An ambulance rushed the eight-month-old to the emergency room at nearby Mount Sinai Hospital, where doctors immediately suspected child abuse. There was 
bruising to the baby's head and hemorrhaging uh, to the eyes of the child. Her brain was bleeding, her skull was cracked. Chanel told doctors the baby had rolled off the couch and fallen on the floor. Doctors performed emergency surgery to relieve pressure on Chantella's brain. Making sure that the child is stable is the most important priority. And after that's done, that's when the Child Protective Services team is notified. The surgeons knew that this could not have happened the way Chanel had told them. Accidental injuries versus inflicted injuries usually look different. Doctors noted that Chantella's eyes showed signs of hemorrhaging or bleeding. Retinal hemorrhages are a huge red flag for uh, inflicted trauma. There has to be a fair amount of force inflicted on their brain to cause bleeding in the retina. They notified DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services, as well as the police, which is their duty in a case like this. Police arrived and questioned both Chanel and Germaine about what happened to their baby. They kept asking me what happened, and I just kept saying she failed. From the way they was looking, you could tell they didn't believe me. They brought Germaine and Chanel down to the police station. She said she had put the baby to sleep, and when she woke up the next morning, the baby had rolled off the couch that she was sleeping on and was on the floor and was having difficulty breathing. Germaine was questioned separately by detectives. He said he had come home late the night before and went to bed, and in the morning, Chanel woke him up and said that the baby was on the floor and had trouble breathing. Chanel's family arrived at the precinct, and authorities released her to their custody. Detectives hoped her family could convince her to tell the truth. The police told me to take her home and talk to her. Jermaine was held overnight at the police station. They actually ended up holding Jermaine because they thought that he had, in fact, committed this murder or caused the injuries to the child. Baby Chantella was on life support in the pediatric intensive care unit, and doctors kept watch over her around the clock. At her grandparents' home, Chanel refused to talk about what happened. I know she was in total shock because she would just, she would just sit there and cry. She wouldn't say a word. She just sat there and cried. I didn't want to see nobody. I didn't want nobody to see me. On February 18th, Chanel phoned detectives and said she was ready to talk but she requested that they take her by the hospital first to see Chantella. I remember her with all those tubes in her and bandages on her. I didn't stay long because I couldn't look at her like that. Detectives then drove Chanel to the precinct for more questioning. When I got to the police station, they talked to me about if it was a mistake, then you could tell us it was a mistake, and then we'd let you go. Chanel then revealed to detectives that baby Chantella's injuries actually occurred three days before she was rushed to the hospital. During the course of this interview, Chanel uh, told us that on Valentine's Day, she had a severe headache, and the baby would not stop crying. I ended up telling the police that I was mad and I had threw up against the wall. And it was a mistake, that's what I told. The baby was pretty lackadaisical uh, for the next couple days, eating very little. By the morning of February 17th, police believe Chanel realized the baby wasn't breathing and finally called 911. Armed with Chanel's confession, police once again questioned Jermaine, who confirmed the abuse. Jermaine was saying uh, the baby was abused by Chanel because Jermaine could come and go as he pleased, and Chanel was stuck at home with the baby. Chanel was arrested and charged with aggravated battery. Jermaine was also charged with the crime. Jermaine was looking at conviction through accountability. He was there at the time the baby was being abused and didn't do anything about it. In Illinois, if you have a child that's being abused and it, it results in death, and you haven't done anything to stop that abuse, you are as guilty as the abuser. On February 19th, two days after she was brought to the hospital, baby Chantella died. I knew she was gone. But I still, I still didn't know how to react to it. 
I didn't process it then, and it still took me years to process it after the fact. The charges against Chanel Boyd and Jermaine Mullen were amended to first-degree murder. Despite being just 16 years old, Chanel would be tried as an adult. Frank Medea was assigned to defend Chanel, who now claimed that she was innocent. She told me uh, Jermaine was an abusive partner, uh, that he's the one who committed the acts which caused the injuries. But Medea knew this was a different story than the one she confessed to police. Chanel was now saying that she had confessed only because she felt pressure from the police, who thought she was guilty. Why would I implicate myself? Because the way that they was talking to me already made me feel like they were saying I did it anyway. I said it because I was still a minor, and I figured they really wasn't going to do too much or nothing. She was pretty much uh, straightforward that Jermaine is the one who did it, and she didn't tell the police that because she was afraid of him. He grabbed me. He was like, you better not tell him I did it. It was really whether the jury believed her statement taken by the police or her testimony that Jermaine is the one who did it. When I got on the stand, I told the jury that Jermaine smashed my baby head against the wall, slammed it against the wall. I thought we had a chance to win our case. I believed her story, and I tried to get the jury to believe her story. The jury thought that since Chanel had made a false statement to the police to start out with, that any testimony she gave was also false, and that's more likely than not why they chose to disbelieve it. I was totally shocked that they found her guilty. There is no doubt in my mind Chanel didn't do this. I saw how she loved that baby. I saw how she took care of that baby. 40 years is a long time for a 16-year-old girl for making a mistake. You have to look at what she knew. She was undereducated. She was poor. She was overwhelmed. It's a you know, very tragic situation because you have babies having babies, and uh, the eight-month-old victim is the tragedy in the case. Unlike Chanel, Jermaine Mullen was not tried by a jury, but by a judge. His lawyer presented Chanel's initial statement that Jermaine was not present when the fatal injuries were inflicted. Based on that statement and the fact that there was no evidence that Jermaine was present, the judge acquitted Jermaine. Chanel Boyd was incarcerated at a medium security prison, three hours drive from Chicago. Everything was hopeless then. I was detached from everything and everybody. I was depressed every day, all day. Staying connected to family, including her mom, who is now off drugs, kept Chanel going and continues to be her lifeline today. I know sometimes she can get depressed. We keep in touch with Chanel through our letters. Chanel and her mom write to each other every day. They develop, they have a close relationship, I think, right now. Looking back, Chanel wishes she had listened to her grandmother and regrets moving in with Jermaine after Chantella was born. I was fine until he got out of jail. I should have just stayed at home, but I did. Chanel maintains she is innocent. I lied when I said that I threw my baby up against the wall. Jermaine did. I think that I shouldn't have been the only one to go to jail. Whether I did it or not, I still hold a lot of resentment towards him. In the meantime, she holds on to the good memories of her baby. I think about Chantelle a lot, every day. Her smile, she was a playful baby. That's what I remember. When I think about it, they all good thoughts.